Okay, so we'll begin with a word of prayer. Um, Your loving Heavenly Father, we ask your presence as we study the book of Ezekiel, um, in particular chapter 37, as we continue from last week's study, we ask you be our teacher and our guide and that we can have a deeper understanding of the words of this here um, chapter and that you help me to present it in a manner which is uh, comprehensible to your to your people and that they be edified and blessed by it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so we've just had an hour thought. <clears throat> I had shared this here last week. Uh, this is the 1,533 days from the, <clears throat> the 11th of August, 1840, to uh, the 22nd of October, 1844, which Ellen White says is a glorious manifestation of the power of God. And um, can be divided into 137 days uh, to the first disappointment, the end of the biblical Hebrew year, uh, 1843, and then you have 187 days inclusive uh, to the, the second disappointment. <clears throat> um, and the prime numbers of, of 187 and 1347 is just like a, uh, and you have an extra digit basically. So 11,117 as opposed to 1,117. And the half there underneath that, what uh, Colin observed um, with uh, the or movement that in the sense or movement was empowered when Trump got elected. Uh, like it was like a fulfilling of what Jeff had predicted back in Lambert Church on the 9th of January 2016. And then similar days, number of days to the first disappointment and in the sense of maybe just maybe not the first disappointment, but um we can certainly mark a disappointment there. And then, in a sense, it was a disappointment again when, by, when Trump wasn't the last president and uh, Biden resumed office. So you have that structure 187 days after July 18. Yes, yeah, so just to come. Um, so, so Colin had, had noticed this. Obviously, he didn't notice the prime number. Right. He just noticed mm -hmm. the number. The parallels, and then and then he placed the the first disappointment and then the second disappointment, paralleling that. And so that would be correct. Now we wouldn't say that that July 18, 2020, is the first disappointment in a bigger line. It's just here it parallels the first disappointment, right? Yes. And so and there are two predictions basically that are being made by this movement, and so. They're typified by these two disappointments in 1844. That is, we have a disappointment regarding July 18th and a disappointment regarding Trump. Right? So that's how we would understand this, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, what about these, uh, these prime numbers? What, what do you think's the significance that we have these prime numbers? Cause we know, um, 11 times 17 is 187. Um, but this one with the, the four ones in the seven, what, what does that mean? I know that's a, a kind of a broad question. Well, I'm going to try to give an explanation to that now. Okay. <laughs> is, is that interesting? <laughs> okay. Um, just another point. Yeah, you did, you did notice there that 11 times 17 here is one eight seven. But this here is the first day of the first month. And this year is the tenth day of the seventh month. Now that's not a very good one. So you could say that's. Uh, but if you take away the, the placeholder, if you take away the, the zero, you can, in a sense, here have 
symbolic there in some way of the uh, 11 times 17, another one at seven, just uh, <clears throat> just taking that first day, first month as like 11, symbolizing that. Um, <clears throat> I want to want to sort of focus on this possible was what you said there. What does that mean? Um, now I had we are aware that in the first day of the first month, <clears throat> in 1844, uh, this year date, uh, the first disappointment. There's a, a quote by Ellen White. She says that uh, in earlier writings we should be aware of. She says, I saw those who cherished the light looking upward with ardent desire, expecting Jesus to come and take them to himself. Soon a cloud passed over them and their faces were sorrowful. I inquired the cause of this cloud and was shown that it was their disappointment. The time when they expected their saviour had passed and Jesus had not come. As discouragement settled upon the waiting ones, the ministers and leading men, whom I had noticed, rejoiced. And all those who had rejected the light triumphantly triumphed greatly, while Satan and his evil angels exulted. Then I heard the voice of another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. A light shone upon those disappointing ones with ardent desires for his appearing. They again fixed their eyes upon Jesus. And then she goes on saying it. And now more angels came um, with the one who cried, Babylon is fallen. And these united with him in the cry, behold, the bridegroom cometh go out to meet them. Actually, there was another quote, I think, in earlier writings as well, where she says, is it some like a, a writing in his hand after the disappointment or a parchment? But anyway, what I'm trying to say is, in a sense here, those who reject it, uh, this message in this time period uh, became the... Um, in the sense, you could say that they were in Babylon, and uh, then they're sort of uh, the call here. In this time period, is that Babylon has fallen, is fallen. <clears throat> and uh, one thing I did notice is that the difference between these here uh, prime numbers in these here periods is. Uh, is 10,000. And if you go to 2 Kings, chapter 24, it talks about Jehoiachin. Uh, it says he is 18 years old when he got in the rain and he reigned uh, three months. And then it talks about Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against Jerusalem. And then uh, it was besieged. And then Jehoiachin, the king, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his princes and his officers, and the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. And uh, mentions there the vessels carried out treasures from the house of the Lord. And then, so we get to verse 14, and he carried away all Jerusalem, all the princes and all the mighty men, even ten thousand captives so in a sense they're going to Babylon so I'm thinking this is uh, from here you have a prime number or in a sense 10,000 is going to go to Babylon uh, and that prime number to this here number here so this would be like the it talks about the pearl being left in the land, and so yeah, that's that's my possible. That's just a thought that came that it's, um, that, that there is symbolizing <clears throat> the ten thousand are going in the Babylon. They're part of the part of that. Uh, they're now the Protestant churches are now constitute Babylon. So would that be a reasonable? explanation for them numbers.
Yeah, that's a that's a very good explanation. And also about the number 10,000, because um, somebody was asking me about the number 10,000 uh, uh, the other day relating to um, the story of Deborah and Brack, I believe it is. So, uh, and we have that, that number show up other places, of course. Yeah, it comes up quite a few times. Yeah. Of- but anyway, so I was looking at it in, in that context, right? Um, and so with the number 10,000, I ended up uh, doing some calculations that I thought were rather interesting. And so the first thing is I, I took uh, 10,000 and I subtracted um, 1872, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we can see how the July 18, 2020 prediction would fit into this structure. Now, uh, let me see, how did I do that? Um, trying to remember now. You have one, two, eight. Um, yeah. Oh, so what I was doing is I was taking one less than it. Um, so how did that, I do that? I'm trying to remember now. Aran, do you remember what I was doing with the uh, 10,000? I forget now. Um, yeah, so so that is if I take um, one less than 10,000, 9,999. And that's just a characteristic of, of um, that number. But I was subtracting another number. Oh, that was the number. So in Daniel chapter um, 11, we were dealing with this this. Hebrew number 6256 that's uh, in because it was in regard to certain times right and um, so let me see if I can find my notes on this oh yeah no who asked I was trying to remember who asked me okay yeah two different people asking me questions I'm getting a bit confused about who asked me what um and where, where where I would find my explanation. So anyway, if I take this number 10,000 and I subtract this Hebrew number 6256, so this is in Daniel chapter 11, um, and we're first going to have it in um, verse 6, where it says, uh, he that strengthened her in these times, and that word times um, is this number 6256. And so we had recognized this number. If you multiply 6 times 2 to five, times 5 times 6, you get 360. Um, um, and then we also noticed that this related to some spans, which I'm not going to go into right now. But the 6256, if you subtract it from 10,000, um, or so, yeah, so... You get this number 3744 and 3744, if you divide it by two is 1872. So I know that may seem a little bizarre, but it shows that this, this 1872 is related to this 10,000. Does that make sense? Now, okay. Now, so if I take one less than 10,000 though, right? And that's just a characteristic of the number nine. So if I have a number, so if I have 999 or 99999 or whatever, and and I have a number that if you add the digits, they add up to nine, then when I subtract that number, like 1872 adds up, uh, um, so you got, uh, it, it adds up to 18, and then you get, um, and that's divisible by nine. So it's a number that's divisible by nine. And then I get this, this number. So if I subtract it, nine, 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 nine minus 1872, I get this number 8127, right? So I get an iteration of those digits, right? So, so I thought that was interesting just because, but that's nine, 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 nine. That's one less than 10,000. But anyway, just getting back to what you have here, I think this is the best explanation um, 
of this number um, because then it shows it's it, they're related to each other with this number 10,000. And so the number 10,000 is significant already. Um, now, the other thing I was looking at with this number was simply um, looking at it as a number of days, right? So, um, six two five six. Uh, the number so, ten thousand, or ten thousand, or not ten thousand, but uh, eleven thousand one hundred and seventeen, right? So, if you took that number as a number of days, um, you know, the question is, it, it's thirty years and one hundred and fifty three days, I think, something like that. Um, let me see if I remember correctly. Um, 100, 159 and a half days. So it's nearly 160 days plus 30 years. Um, so if, if we counted that from uh, November 9th, for instance, 1989, it's going to bring us to April 17th, 2020, which I don't know anything significant about April 17th, 2020. Um, but it may be that we count it from some other date. That's all I'm saying. So it might be a span of time, right? It, it doesn't work from that date. So I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But anyway, I think your, your explanation is way better than any of mine. It's just, that's how I was looking at it. Maybe it was a number of days. Mm -hmm. But, and it might relate to some number of days that, that we haven't considered, but it is 30 years, 160 days. So, so uh, applying that to the bottom line there with the July 18 prediction, mm -hmm. my thoughts when then, could you say then in some sense, those who rejected July 18, there's that sort of division cast off, they've in a sense gone into Babylon they're part of the 10,000 you've gone into Babylon since July 18th it's a thought as well uh, yeah you could with um, with July 18th so that lining up with Jehoiachin here in this year yeah. right here, um we you know we know that uh, Jehoiachin he did rule three months in two kings uh, twenty eight verse two uh, sorry twenty eight sorry twenty four verse eight and then if we go to two chronicles thirty six verse nine he reigns three months and ten days and if you you know obviously you're going to do it's thirty days. A month, so it's going to be like 90 days there. And this one here, it's going to be 100 days. It's three months plus 10 days. Yeah. And so you have there 190 days. So you have there the prophetic days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, or yeah. 187 days. Basically, if you combine them to calculations, I know he, he didn't roll more. He didn't rashly, but if you just add them up. So in a sense, you have a 187, we know, uh, yep. Jehoiachin. So you can maybe have a sort of line up with Jehoiachin July 18. Okay. Well. And with that, there are two chronicles. It's 36 verse, uh, verse 9. And we know that July 18 was in the Julian calendar. Uh, it was the, the tenth day, the fifth month, and then with the Gregorian calendar, it's the twenty sixth day of the fourth month, and if you so you have like a three six nine there as well. You can maybe connect that with July eighteen. Um, okay. So, so that was just some thoughts I had uh, concerning uh, them prime numbers. Okay. <clears throat> okay. That, that makes sense. Um, I had the touch ness here last week as well. But uh, Ezekiel, here we have the first 
uh, four dates. One down here. And the first date is related to seven chapters. The next date to 12 chapters. The next date to four chapters. And the next date uh, to one chapter, which deals until the, the message then goes to Egypt, to Moab, Ammon, and so forth. But there's only okay. really one chapter after it deals with with the uh, with Jerusalem mm-hmm. when uh, Ezekiel is then dumb. Yeah, and I've, I've tied this here in with the, the sanctuary. You have the seven chapters, seven branched candlesticks. Twelve chapters are linked to the twelve loaves of showbread. The four chapters to the four horns of the altar of incense, and then just have one with related to the ark. But I noted that uh, just an additional thing I didn't mention last week. If uh, you do like what we did with the other dates we have with Ezekiel, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you add them up together. Yeah, these here, as for this would be 54, 56, yeah. 105, and 110. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have the number 1225. Relates to the, the, you maybe connect that to the 12th month, 25th day, 25th of December. Mm-hmm. In symbol. Um, also, the two next dates that we, you find uh, in the book of Ezekiel that you come across is the, uh, the first day of the fifth month. That's the prophecy against Tyre. So that was one of the dates. That we had connected with uh, the 187. Um, so that would be the first day of the fifth month. And then the next date is the 12th day of the 10th month. And if you add them together, you again have uh, 1225. Okay. And then add them all together, that would be uh, 2450, which would be the Great Jubilee. Yeah. Um, Interesting in itself, the Great Jubilee divided by two gives you the symbol of December 25th. Yes. And then if you go to the time when Jacob, Jacob, he's, he's, uh, he goes to Haran and uh, marries Leah and Rachel. So when they married, the year that he's, he's 84 at that time, because he's already worked seven years for Leah. Yeah, which is 12 times seven, yeah. Yeah. So then he's, yeah. he's going to work another seven years. And then then seven years, if you take Jacob as being the one, you have his 12th offspring and then seven years by four women. So the yeah. two maid servants. So that again connects to the, the chapters mm-hmm. that we find there in Ezekiel. And then with Joseph, uh, he was 56 years old when Jacob died and he left another 54 years. <clears throat> so you have there the, the first two numbers. Uh, these here, the 50, you have the 56 there and uh, Mm-hmm. 54. And if you add the 105 um, of the next one, it gives you 215, which relates to the, the midpoint of the 430 years yeah. of Galatians 317. And we have Abraham also in that history in that first 215 year period being 105. So we have like, like similar uh, numbers that we find that connects to these here dates uh, symbolically yeah. and uh, the guilt. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so thanks for that part there. So there, there, you know, just to comment on it, I know I was like commenting when you're doing videos, um, just because it brings to mind many different things. So one of the things we see um, in that story uh, is you got the four and the seven together, right? Mm-hmm. And and we know that that relates to the four seven times. So one of the ways that we understand 
um, this whole, uh, uh, like the prophetic mirror, for instance, is on the chart. You got seven times 12, right? And, and that gives you 84 and then you multiply that by 31. So you, so you have these different calculations that we can do where we can put these numbers together. But the four seven times, um, um, these relate to prophecies against God's people, right? Which is the 12 tribes. So you could even relate the four seven times with the four of the seven and the, um, the 12 plus also the one being God, right? In his covenant. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so there are different ways you could look at this as well. Okay. Anyway, thanks for that part. And so last week we had covered a, a section of this here, uh, chapter 37, uh, dealing with the Valley of Dry Bones. And uh, so we know that Ezekiel sees these here Valley of Dry Bones and uh, they look very dry and he prophesizes to them and they there's a noise and shaking and uh, the bones come together. And uh, just touching on a shaking, I said about El White replies that in a past tense. Or um, she says the mighty shaking has commenced and will go on. <clears throat> uh, we are in the shaking time, so presently. And then she has it like a future. She says there is to be a shaking among God's people. And then in the Next quote uh, from, from this in the early writings as well. She says, she talks about the shaking uh, as in the sense of future sense, I believe. It's um, amongst, it was uh, be caused by the true, the council, by the straight testimony called forth by the council of the true witness to the Laodiceans. They will rise up against it. This is what will cause a shaking amongst God's people. And then we have another prophecy where the sinews and the flesh come upon the bones. Um, or sorry, there's, sorry, the breath has to come in upon the sinews and the flesh. And that's uh, 37 verse 9. She says, uh, prophesy, or, well, Ezekiel says, prophesy, or God says to Ezekiel, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds of breath and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Um, now the four winds, uh, you could relate that to the uttermost as being like the whole, meaning like a global thing, um, and Mark chapter 13, verse 27, Christ says, he shall send his angels and then and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the outermost part of the earth. So you have like a global aspect in the four winds there. And then we have the four winds being mentioned in uh, Revelation 7, 1 to 4. <clears throat> we have the four angels holding the four winds and then another angel comes and says to hold, don't blow until the God's people are sealed. So this is an event that takes place before the Sunday law, because Elmite, she, she adds a lot of quotes where she says the sealing takes place uh, in that, uh, when the sealing actually happens, there's like a preparation time, and then we're sealed in the actual, when the Sunday law takes place. Um, we've seen that the four winds, you get like a similar language there in Revelation 9 verse 4, uh, with uh, Revelation 7 verse 3 and 9 verse 4, we've connected that to, to Islam and connected to the saving of God's people. <clears throat> And you've similar language here in Revelation 9.15, four angels were loosed. 
So there's four angels holding the four winds, and then they're loosed. Uh, and the when the four angels are loosed, we know that's the uh, the cause of probation. Fully Alamai says that's the time of the seven last plagues. But here we have for this year sealing to take place. It has to be before the Sunday law. So therefore, there has to be some element where these here four winds are um, somehow connected uh, prior prior to the Sunday law. I just sort of made a, this is Ezekiel here. He's saying come from the four winds. So it's like uh, he's saying to this year time period from the close of probation to the second coming of Christ, the time when the four winds are loosed. That's the four, four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary and then will come the seven last plagues. So in a sense, he's calling for like an aspect of the four winds uh, just to sort of come to when he is, his body is formed and then there's breath entering into that body. And that this, well, we marked the, the sitting 144,000 begins at that their time. Uh, there's like a preparation time before they're, they're finally sealed uh, at the Sunday law. And then the church proclaims the loud cry of the third angel. And we've sort of connected this here, come from the four winds uh, to the, uh, the events of 9-11. You have um, Ellen White, a quote we're familiar with from 1906. She says about the great buildings going up there story by story when she was in New York. And then she says, what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. And this is applying again to the time after the close of probation. Then you have the seven last plagues. Uh, this is when, this is the day of the Lord. She says, then the words of Revelation 18, 1 to 3 will be fulfilled. So this would be the, the very last point of their fulfillment. So obviously there's going to be a fulfillment before that where you have people in Babylon called to come out. So there wouldn't be any point if that was just fulfilled and only fulfilled there at the close of probation. So it goes back further in time. Um, okay, Steve. Maybe... So, yeah. so sorry to interrupt you here because because uh, I wasn't listening because I was doing something else and I'm going to have you explain that again. But I want to go back to this uh, verse itself about the four winds. So uh, you know that um, Iran has added to the Bible, um, uh, the Bible indexer. He's added where you can add up the Hebrew numbers of a verse. So that mm -hmm. Ezekiel 37 verse 9, uh, it the lexical sum, it's called the lexical, that's from the, um, the lexicon, right? Six six four four eight, right? That's that's the number that we get. And this number is really interesting because if you um, if you look at that number six six four four eight, it's 187 Islamic years and 187 days. <laughs> so it relates exactly to to. Islam and the July 18 symbol. So 187 Islamic years. That is an Islamic year is 354.367044 days. And that's just simply the length of the, the month um, times 12, right? So if you take the length of the month times 12 times 187, and then you add 187 days, you'll get that number 66448. So, so that's pretty. Of, yeah, the length of the month is what, 29.54? Is it something like that there? Is that what you mean? Yeah, it does, you don't have to be that precise, but 25, uh, uh, yeah, so month is 29.53058789. Uh, or 588 or 594, depending on which. Uh, uh, millennium you're in, right? So right now it's 29.53058. Uh, but if you just put like five, 
uh, 29.530059 or something like that. It'll give you close, is close enough. And then you just multiply. So if I took 94, for instance, and, and that's, um, that was in, you know, the time that Ezekiel wrote, that's how long a month was. And, and you multiply it by 12, you get a little larger number. It's, uh, 354.367. And then you multiply that by 187. And then you add 187. And you'll get this, um, it's going to be slightly more. So that one won't quite work. You'd have to use the, um, so I, the one I use is 29.530587. Right, so that one's going to be the, so you multiply that by um, 29 point, I'm just doing the math here, 0. 0.587 times, um, I keep making mistakes, times 12 gives you, um, yeah, so it's 354.367. Uh, zero four four, and then you multiply that. that. So I'll do this again. Yeah, so you times that by one eighty seven, and then you add one eighty seven. How do I do that? Yeah. So the other way to do it. So the best way to do it is it's is to do it the other way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this number six six four four eight. I divide it by 354.36044, pardon me, 367.044, and I'll get 187.5179, so I subtract 187, and then I multiply that by 365, pardon me, not by 360, yeah, 365.25, uh, that's what I was doing now. And that's going to give me 187 days. Yeah, so I was doing it the wrong way that when I was trying to show you. So what it is, it's 187 days plus 187 uh, Islamic years. And that will give you that number, uh, 66448. So 187 Islamic years is 66266. It's 187. And then you add... 187, and you'll get this 66448. So it's 66266 plus 187. I'm doing something wrong. I'm not sure what I'm doing. I, I always keep making a mistake. So let me do it again. So... 350. Sorry about that. Anyway, you can keep going. Doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Okay. I keep doing, I, every time I use a calculator, I make mistakes. I'm not sure why. Yeah. So this would be my understanding of Ezekiel 37 verse 9. Ezekiel's at 9 11, and he's saying, Come from the four winds. And 9 11, you're, you're sort of getting like a snapshot or like a harbinger. Of the seven yep. aspects time period. Because Ellen White, she's talking about that four winds being let loose in the time period. Uh, this, well, she's connecting it here that the great buildings of New York being thrown down and then the Lord rises to shake terror with the earth. That's when the four winds are loosed. So in the sense there that they're, uh, Ezekiel there, he's, uh, Prophesying, uh, uh, in a sense, is a harbinger at 9-11. And then that begins the, the saving of the 144,000. This is when the breath begins to enter the body in our preparation for the Sunday law, when we, the, the church proclaims the loud cry of the third angel. And the bodies stand upon their feet, an exceeding mighty army. And that body, uh, sort of, you have here like a 
connection to Genesis 2, verse 7. I discussed this last week, where you sort of lined up the phrases of Genesis 2, verse 7, with Ezekiel 37, verses 7, 8, and 10. Mm -hmm. uh, the body come together, the Lord God form, forms the body from the dust of the ground, breathes into their nostrils, and man became a living soul. And as they stand upon their feet in the exceeding great uh, army. <clears throat> Ellen White says the dry bones are the unsaved in that passage. And then I think we had read this here. And then she applies, applies, the, um, applies it to the church as well. And, um, so it's an exceeding great army prior to the close of probation. Uh, he says he will lead forth an exceeding great army to the conquest of the world. Such a leader, we may gain victory in every conflict. So my understanding here, this year army is formed and they're conquesting the world. It's in the sense that they're calling people out of Babylon. Uh, an exceeding great army after the close of probation. In this quote, um, so in this quote, the phrase is used in the context of the general resurrection of the righteous, when all the children all God's children would have been resurrected to eternal life. And there, uh, yeah, so that's from Four Spiritual Gifts, 463. So there, there is, I think I might have covered that last week. Uh, Hosea expresses the concept of the great army with a differing terminology. Uh, I think we read that as well. It talks about the sun the sea, which cannot be numbered. Being a, a great, a terrible, an exceedingly great army. And then we have verse 11. I think this is roughly where we're finished off. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Um, so I have here where she talks about Martin Luther. She says, viewed from a human standpoint, the path of duty and righteousness is not a path of peace and safety. By faith, we must follow as the Lord leads us onward. Uh, but could we always discern the everlasting arms around and beneath us? There would be no occasion for exercise of faith. Um, then she talks about this here, eagle going up over the mountains. And then she says, just uh, this fair point. So when the, the hand of the Lord was upon the prophet Ezekiel in the vision of the valley of the dry bones, he was commanded to prophesy to the wind. And in answer to his word, life was restored to the slain. They stood up they stood up before him, an exceeding great army. This figure was presented before the prophet to show that no work of restoration can be too hard for God to do, and none who trust in him need ever say as Israel has said, our hope is lost. Like the eagle, Luther had been shut in by dense clouds of superstition and Romish heresy, and he had been beaten about by the fiercest, fierce temptation, sorry, the fierce tempest, tempest of opposition. But on the mighty wings of, but on the wings of a mighty faith, he had risen above the storm and was now grandly free with the sunlight of heaven shining upon his soul. So, just uh, so she quotes Ezekiel 37 in that context, and that uh, we are to have, even though things may not look great in the movement, uh, we are not to say our hope is lost, that God can breathe life into us. And then verse 12, therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my, peop my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And I and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I am the Lord, have spoken it, and performed it, saith the Lord. So she says, not only does the simile of the dry bones apply to the world, but also to those who have been blessed with great light, though for for they are also, for they also are like the skeletons of the valley. They have the form of men, the framework of a body, 
but they have no spiritual life. The parable of the the parable does not leave the dry bones merely knit together into the forms of men, for it is not enough that there is symmetry of limb and feature. The breath of life must vivify the bodies that they may stand upright and spring into activity. These bones represent the house of Israel, the church of God, and the hope of the church is the vivifying influence of the Holy Spirit. The Lord must breathe upon the dry bones that they may live. The Spirit of God, is a, with its vivifying power, must be in every human agent, that, the, that every spiritual muscle and sinew may be in exercise. Without the Holy Spirit, without the breath of God, there is torpidity of conscience, loss of spiritual life. Many who are without spiritual life have their names on church records, but they are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Um, so it just talks about just the last paragraph, the last bit. She says, the dead are often made to pass for the living, for those who are working out what they term salvation after their own ideas have not God working in them to do, to will and to do his good pleasure. This class is well represented by the Valley of Dry Bones, Ezekiel saw and vision. So we just have some other quotes there, the dry bones. Well, that's too much to read. So Ezekiel's prophecy to the dry bones was a life-giving message of Christ's righteousness. She says, what power must we have from God that icy hearts, having over only a legal religion, should see better things provided for them? Christ and his righteousness, a life-giving message was needed to give life to the dry bones. And then she has these here quotes uh, concerning revival and reformation which we can maybe connect to the forming of a body and the life being the, the revival, the breath coming into the body being the revival. So there's a lot of quotes there, stuff like that. And then I come to a section about the joining of the two sticks. It says in verse 15, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, moreover, son of man, take the one stick, write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, Take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So Jeroboam, the first king of the ten tribes, was the tribe of Ephraim, was off the was off the tribe of Ephraim, and Samaria, the metrol, metropolis of that of the kingdom, was in that tribe. Hence Ephraim often stands for all the ten tribes, for the kingdom of Israel as distinct from that of Judah. So that was a quote from um, John Gill. So that's why he's, he's sort of commentating on that verse. I think it was a, a good point, uh, connecting out to the, the separation that occurred in 977, when you have Israel and Judah being separated. In the sense there, you have a, the two sticks coming apart, which Ezekiel is going to talk about them coming together again. You have the, the, the stick with the writing being mentioned, uh, a writing being on it, uh, relating to the uh, time when Aaron, uh, his rod, budded. Um, they were to, to write upon the name of these here rods. And then verse 17. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. So there's some very sort of similar uh, stories of these two tribes coming together. You have Isaiah prophesying, The envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Um, the root of the theme where there is a separation of Judah and Joseph and a later coming together could be traced back to the book of Genesis. The separation of Joseph from his brothers was initiated by Judah when he said unto his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sail him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh and we, sorry, and his brethren were content. 
And then Judah's going to play a role in the reconciling of himself and his brothers with Joseph. After Joseph's cup had been found in Benjamin's sack, uh, they're brought back to Joseph. And then we have uh, Judah approach Joseph, uh, saying that he's going to take the place of Benjamin because uh, he mentions about his father and so forth. Um, so these here following diagrams sort of reveal time structures from the days of Jacob and Joseph uh, that relate to the history, 1798 to 1863, where there is a people separated from the Protestant churches, namely Seventh-day Adventist Church. This then sets the scene and establishes the players for the end time application of the joining of the two sticks when Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, representing the Protestant churches, will come out of Babylon and join the commandment keeping people of God, symbolized by Judah, representing faithful Seventh day Adventists. So we have this here structure in, in the life of Joseph. He's 17 years in Haran and Canaan. And then Judah initiates the sale of Joseph as a slave. And you have 11 years to to when uh, Butler and Beggar, the dreams occur. And then it's going to be another 17 years to when uh, Judah again, there's a famine in the land of Canaan. They come, the sons come down in, to, G, to Egypt and Joseph saying he's the prime minister of Egypt. And uh, Judah's then going to offer to be a slave in the place of Benjamin. And there previously, that's sort of like parallels 22 years earlier in the chiasm where Judah, Judah initiates, initiates the sale of Joseph as a slave. And uh, from the, and then there's going to be like another 17 years when Joseph and Jacob are reunited to when Jacob dies, and that's in 1731 BC. And then there's, this year marks a period of 252 times 7 years to 34 AD, and the end of literal Israel as a as the foundation, uh, and then the sort of end of literal Israel in 34 AD, Stephen is stoned, and then you have the Christian church, that goes to uh, 1798, and you have Joseph and Jesus sort of parallel with them, sort of connects connects with this here time period to 1798. Joseph is 30, Jesus is 30, when he's baptized, Joseph be a prime minister, seven years of plenty, and then you have the seven years to the stoning of Stephen, and then seven years to when the famine ends, uh, to being divided between two and five years. And then you have that two and five years represented by two times two five two, and then five times two five two. Um, so the twenty five twenty also connects into this, uh, the structure of uh, two hundred fifty two years times seven um, to thirty four A.D. from when Israel, when uh, Jacob died, and you have, that's. Uh, Four times 252 takes you to the beginning of the 2520 years that end in 1798. And that's divided into five times 252 to the papacy reigning supreme and five times 252 to 1798. Um, so when the kingdom is divided, the two sticks are formed. And that parallels 30 years when Joseph, so you have 300 years to when, uh, 2520 to, uh, Judah occurs, and Manasseh taken captive in 677, and that parallels the 30 years when Joseph is made prime minister, and then you have seven years of plenty, the famine, and that's aligns with the Babylonian captivity, and then you have 70 years there, which parallels the seven years uh, so when the famine ends, and you have two years and five years that are, can be connected to the 20 years to the siege, and then 50 years to when uh, Cyrus is enthroned. And Jacob there was 130, 
when Joseph and uh, Jacob re- reunite, and then it's 130 years to Artaxerxes' decree. And there we're uh, 2520, and uh, we can sort of connect. Uh, there's like a structure here. Um, that uh, connects this here whole pattern to 2520 from the time of uh, when Joseph and uh, Judah separated. So this is the the historical theme of the separation and joining of the two sticks with a date and span correlation relating to the dedication of Solomon's temple. So there's quite a lot of (laughs) just going through it briefly. So when Judah and Joseph separated, it's 22 years. Then it's going to be 742 years until the glory of the Lord fills the temple. So uh, this is when um, Solomon's temple is built and dedicated. You have this here glory. And then it's going to be uh, another 29 years to when Joseph and Judah are in a sense separated. Uh, when um, Rehoboam and Jeroboam uh, become uh, kings of the north and the south and then it's going to be when the Judah and Joseph are united it's going to be uh, 1006 years to uh, 742 BC so that sort of connects with a, a date 1006, B, uh, 1006 years connects to the the 742 years to to when the temple is built, and then um, the date, and then the 742 years to about to our time connects with the 742 BC and the beginning of the uh, prophetic mirror, which uh, ends in 1863. And there you have the two players. You have Judah in a sense with the Seventh Day Adventist Church being formed. And uh, there's going to be a time then when these two sticks are going to be reunited. reunited. So the Protestants, they've now gone into Babylon and uh, come the Sunday law, they're going to be called out. Of Babylon, you have the earth being lightened with the glory, um, with, lightened with glory in the Revelation 18 verse 1. And then you have that called Babylon has fallen, come out might have heard my people. And so that's when Joseph and Judah, Ephraim and Judah are reunited, two sticks. And um, in in the, the temple here, you have also at the end of 742 years, uh, you have that the glory of the Lord fills the temple. So that sort of connects with this, the earth being lightened with the glory. Of Revelation 18 verse 1. So we have this here sort of uh, connection right from the Sunday law going back to this here when Joseph and Judah are separated. This here initial story of the two sticks going right to the end of the world as a theme. So that's me trying to explain it, maybe not very well. <laughs> No, I mean, I'm, yeah, because we've looked at this before in different ways. Now, you bring some other things in here, like the 106 BC and the 106 years, which I think are interesting. And uh, But the idea here is that we can take the joining of the two sticks and connect it back to the first separation. And, and this relates to our study dealing with the civil wars that we've been doing in the morning studies. So... Um, so the idea that these two sticks, these two 2520s, um, that they're one on top of the other and they're joined together. Because in, in Millerite history, they had an opportunity to join together when these sticks end, these two 2520s end. But that ends up being extended into our period when they actually join together because of the Protestants not accepting the message. I don't know if mm-hmm. I explained that, but 
but you can see how yes. these two, the two 2520s are related way back to the past. And, and remember, we also connected those, uh, um, that span of uh, uh, six, what is it, um, 1,764 years, right? That's going to go back to um, the end of that structural chiasm in the story of Joseph. That's when he's going to bless his sons. And that's going to go to 34 AD. And then from 34 AD to 1798. So, so already that history is connected back through these 2520 structures. Yes. Yeah. So, so there's so many connections and the two sticks here is just another way of connecting these, these histories. Mm -hmm. so, thanks for that. Okay. So, um, So this is just more relating to the joining of the two sticks. I have here your quote that you mentioned, uh, the two sticks of the widow of Zerapath, uh, that you connected it to yeah. the joining of the two sticks. Um, you, you said that this passage, uh, you applied it this, the woman and her son represent those who are studying God's word for light. So that... Uh, um, they're gathering sticks. Um, they have a handful of meal. Uh, um, and they have, what is it? They have, uh, I don't remember. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So they understand a little of the God's word. They have about a, about a handful of meal. They have only a little oil, God's spirit. And they are gathering two sticks. They're studying the prophecies of God's word, God's, of God's word regarding the restoration of Israel and Judah, that they may eat, understand, and die to self. It is to these that Elijah is sent with the promise that the barrel of meal, God's word, shall not waste, will not fail, neither shall the cruise of oil, the Holy Spirit's promise, fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth, the latter rain be poured out. Uh, the gathering of the two sticks occurs before the Sunday Law test. This is typified by the events on Mount Carmel, well, where Elijah defeats the prophets of Baal. Protestants and some Adventists will unite under one banner. They will unite to give the final message uh, to the world. So I sometimes think it's the Sunday Law test that separates um, God's church is then purified would be my understanding yeah well we do also uh, we do the beast test that precedes the Sunday law itself well in a way but when I when I looked into that the Sunday the image of the beast basically El might is sort of like saying it's almost the same thing as the mark of the beast yeah I know I know it's just that the image of the beast is first formed in order for the Sunday law to come. And it's going to be seeing that happening before the actual law itself comes into place where many people are going to be making their choice, right? Because they can't just wait till the Sunday law comes and then make a decision. They have to make that decision beforehand. But yes, with, yeah. Things, yeah, things will be in, will be agitated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, William Miller, he's, uh, he made an application of joining the two sticks. He says the two sticks represent the two covenants or two dispensations called the law and the gospel. So that was his understanding back in, uh, 1842. Um, and, uh, sort of, I haven't really fully grasped his understanding at the time. I just sort of, I just added it recently. I'm, I'm really, I went sort of through it briefly, but um, basically that's uh, just sort of like a brief sort of of uh, chapter 37. I think I've added it to the, the chat last week. People yeah. want to study it in, in uh, more detail.
So that's well, thank uh, you even for that. That's very good. Okay. So you want to close with prayer and then Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's pray. Your loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the book of Ezekiel and all your holy words in the Bible, Father, that uh, should give light for our feet. And we know there's going to be a time when these year two sticks, this year prophecy is going to be fulfilled. And we ask that uh, you can enable us to be amongst those that uh, give up message to Protestants who are in Babylon to come out and be among those who keep your commandments and that reverend, reverencing your holy Sabbath day. And um, we pray that uh, we see these here things as we see these things approaching, Father, that uh, we can be led by your Spirit. You guide us each day in our studies and that we can be prepared for that their time and be with us the rest of this year, holy day. And that may our fellowship with you and one another uh, be blessed and help us to represent you in all we do and say in the coming week. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.